This is a topic that we are starting to discuss is chemical bonding. This is very important from the perspective of chemistry because chemical bonding essentially determines the shapes of the molecules that we deal with and eventually it is also a very good descriptor of the kind of chemical reactions that these molecules can participate in. To begin with, there were several theories of chemical bonding or specifically covalent chemical bonding that has come into shape. There was the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory which we call as the VACPR theory or the VACPR model. There was the hybridization model which is actually taught in the schools nowadays. There is a the molecular orbital theory and we go over to apply these theories in case of certain molecules which are essentially diatomic to begin with and then we will take up certain complex molecular structures using these three basic theoretical models. Fine, to begin with, let us take the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory first. The VACPR model or the VACPR theory of chemical bonding is essentially a model which takes into account the fact that it is a repulsion in between the bonded pairs of electrons, the non-bonded pairs of electrons and so on which determines or dictates the shapes of these molecules. In the VSAPR model, it is always assumed that, that the repulsion in between two non-bonding pairs of electrons is the greatest. And this is followed by a repulsion in between a non-bonded pair and a bonded pair and the least repulsion is actually enjoyed by the two bonded pair of electrons. Since electrons are the true descriptor of chemical properties associated with atoms and molecules. VACPR model essentially tries to predict, tries to give light or tries to provide some account of the molecular shapes of really complex molecular structures. It actually gives us an idea of the possibility of what is the best orientation or the best disposition in three dimensional space of these atoms. The non-bonding pair of electrons which we call as the lone pairs as I have just said that the lone pair lone pair repulsion is the highest, the lone pair bond pair repulsion is the intermediate followed by the bond pair bond pair repulsion which is the least. So since the lone pair lone pair repulsion is the, is the maximum, we try to put these non-bonding pairs or the lone pairs farthest apart. That means they should be placed in a manner that they enjoy a position which is the farthest from one another so that the repulsion is minimal and the molecule gets eventually stabilized in energy to the maximum. The polarity of molecules of polyatomic molecules actually depend on the molecular shape. So this VACPR model essentially since it dictates, since it gives an idea about the molecular shape it is, it is essential to understand this VACPR model in a very clear cut and comprehensive manner. So this slide though not very big, I mean the structures are really small over here, we will take up these individual structures at later stages that this particular slide actually gives you the variety or the different classes of shapes that the VACPR model can take into account. So, if I move ahead, let us let us take up a simple certain simple cases. See, in this table, I have summarized different molecular shapes that can be predicted by means of the VACPR model. Over here, firstly, I have placed the number of electron pairs and this electron pair geometry followed by the number of bond pairs, the number of lone pairs and certain examples. To so take up, first let us have a case where we have just two electron pairs and these electron pairs lie in a linear fashion and both these electron pairs are essentially bond pairs, so there are no lone pairs, the molecule is linear in structure. This is the case with beryllium chloride. 
If you go to a slightly more difficult case, if you have three electron pairs and all of these three are essentially bonded pairs, then you have a trigonal structure with no lone pair, you have a trigonal molecule like BF3. Okay. If you have, if you have again three lone pairs and all of these are in a planar disposition, two are bonded and there is one lone pair over here, you have a V-shaped molecule like the germanium chloride. If you have four electron pairs, you get a tetrahedral arrangement and all of these four are bond pairs and there are no lone pairs at all, you get the tetrahedral structure as in methane. And if you can just go down, you will be getting more and more complex structures as you just go down along the columns of this particular table. What actually dictates these molecular shapes? These molecular shapes are essentially dictated by certain bonding models. The, the best bonding model that we have by far come across is the molecular orbital model or the, the corresponding localized electron model which we will discuss a little bit later. So let, let us first take up the molecular orbital model and then go over to the localized molecular model. So there are these different sorts of possibilities of these atomic orbitals which can mix with one another. Since molecules, molecules are bound are, or molecules are essentially formed by means of atoms getting bound together by one another using these extra nuclear electrons, using these electrons which forms the bonds and these orbitals, the orbitals in their atoms can hybridize, they can mix with one another provided these orbitals are energetically proximate. So, if you, if you look at the structure of methane, there are the possibility that the 2p and 2s orbitals of carbon, they mix with one another and they form 4 sp3 hybrid orbitals. This you have already studied in school. However, if they are not allowed to mix, what would have happened? Firstly, overlaps of carbon 2p and 2s orbitals with hydrogen 1s orbital will lead to two different kinds of CH bonds. One CH bond would have been formed by the combination or by the overlap of the 1s orbital of hydrogen with the 2p orbital of carbon and another kind of CH bond would have been formed by the overlap of 1s orbital of hydrogen with the 2s orbital of carbon. But this is not the case. Methane has all four carbon hydrogen bonds equivalent. Fine. So if this is so, then these orbitals 2s and 2p in carbon must be allowed to mix with one another and the methane molecule is experimentally known to be tetrahedral in structure with a bond angle of 109 degree and 28 minutes. So hybridization of atomic orbitals in methane will be like this. The 2s and 2p atomic orbitals in carbon mix to form four completely identical hybrid orbitals. So, so these orbitals we call as the hybrid orbitals, keep in mind. And the orbital, this process of mixing these orbitals is the hybridization. So what we end up with? We end up with having four sp3 hybrid orbitals and because they are formed from one 2s and three 2p orbitals. So this is one of the rules of thumb that this is very interesting that the total number of atomic orbitals that are mixing will be equal to the total number of hybrid orbitals that are eventually formed. So the four sp3 hybrid orbitals are identical in shape and they occupy a tetrahedral disposition, a tetrahedral geometry in the three dimensional space. So these are the shapes of these orbitals. You see, this is the spherically symmetric 2s orbital and these are the three 2p orbitals, 2px, 2py and 2pz. So mixing, the process of mixing of these s with these three p orbitals induces, induces some sort of s character within these p orbitals. Since s orbital by definition is a spherically symmetric structure, it's a spherically symmetric form in three dimensional space. So the elongated nature 
of the 2p orbitals that were there prior to mixing gets a little bit distorted and these hybrid orbitals assume something, something a, a bit more circular in shape owing to the presence of this s orbital. So these are the four sp3 hybrid orbitals that are there in methane. So with these four sp3 hybrid orbitals, these four individual hydrogen 1s orbitals overlap to form CH4. So what has happened essentially? So during the process of hybridization, just before hybridization, the 2s and 2p orbitals are separated by a very small amount of energy. They are energetically proximate. So they do not require very high amount of energy. So there is no very high energy demand to, to allow for this hybridization. Once hybridized, these four orbitals, one, two, three, and this one, the fourth one, they will assume the same energy value. And these four are the four sp3 hybrid orbitals. Now with this sp3 hybrid orbitals, each hydrogen atom will be overlapping with these four orbitals to form the four carbon hydrogen bonds. If you go over to another class of hybridization, which is the sp2 hybridization, the, 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 the entire thing is a bit different. The first such case, first such instance, the simplest one also is ethylene. If you look at the ethylene molecule, this particular molecule has got, has got two carbon atoms. So by the name of this hybridization sp2, you know that it is the one 2s orbital of carbon atom mixing with two 2p orbitals on the same carbon atom, leaving one of the 2p orbitals of the carbon atom in an unhybridized form. So once this is there, so you end up having 1 plus 2, 3, 3 sp2 hybrid orbitals. So this is the, this is the case of 2s and the two 2p orbitals. These are the sp2 hybridized orbitals and this is the final form of the structure. Fine. Once this hybridization has taken place, keep in mind the same form of hybridization occurs in the both the carbon atoms in ethylene. So each of these carbon atoms in ethylene will be having two unhybridized p orbitals lying 90 degree or orthogonal or perpendicular whatever you say above the molecular plane and these each of these unhybridized p orbitals can I mean will be having one electron each and they have the possibility they can simply overlap in this sidewise manner. So sp2 hybridization leads to the formation of pi bonds. So the idea of the formation of pi bonds essentially comes through the sp2 hybridization. So these are this is a pictorial representation. See this is one of the carbon atoms with these three green sp2 hybrid orbitals while this deep blue one is the unhybridized p orbital. So if you look at the molecular plane, then the sigma bond is formed by the direct overlap of these two sp2 hybrid orbitals from the two carbon atoms. If you, if you go over to, if you go over to the three dimensional structure, you will see that, okay, there are, there are one, two, three, four, five sigma bonds, one being the carbon carbon sigma bond and the other four being the carbon hydrogen sigma bonds and the unhybridized p orbitals over here and here, each containing one electron can overlap in a sidewise manner to form the two, uh, I mean the two, these two electrons will form the corresponding pi orbital. So the entire idea of pi orbital comes into picture with the sp2 hybridization. If you go over to the sp hybridization, which is more complex, I mean in, in, in form, which is there in the carbon dioxide molecule, you will see one s orbital mixing with one p orbital leading to these two sp hybrid orbitals and leaving aside distinctly two unhybridized p orbitals. Now these two unhybridized p orbitals can lead to the formation of two distinct pi bonds in carbon monoxide. Acetylene is another example where the two carbon atoms get sp hybridized and the two 
pi orbitals lead to the I mean do unhybridized p orbitals lead to the formation of the two pi bonds in acetylene. So in this particular example you are seeing that the, these two unhybridized p orbitals on these carbon and oxygen they lead to the formation of the corresponding pi bonds. So pi bonds is always a consequence of, of the presence of unhybridized p orbitals. Keep in mind another thing as you move ahead from typical sp3 to sp2 and then to sp the percentage of s character in these hybrid orbitals keeps on increasing progressively while in sp3 you have just 25 percent s character you have 33.3 percent s character in the sp2 hybrid orbitals and you have 50 percent of s character in the sp hybrid orbitals the increase of the percentage of s character is actually related to different sorts of chemical properties associated with these structures. The acidity of the corresponding hydrogen atoms, their reactivity in general are often dictated by the presence of more s or less s of orbitals in their hybrid structures. Now let us move over to a slightly different and a bit more complex form of hybridization which involves the d orbitals. So this is the first instance where I have a dsp3 orbital and the example being the phosphorus pentachloride. The dsp3 means you have 1, 2 and 3 that means total of 5 such atomic orbitals combining to form 5 hybrid orbitals and they assume a structure like this which is essentially a trigonal bipyramid. If you go over to d2sp3 you have 6 such atomic orbitals hybridizing and you have found out ultimately 6 hybrid orbitals which are in this form of a perfect octahedron. So if you, if you, if you simply try to look at these hybridization, hybridized structures you can go over to different levels of complexity, different levels of complexity associated with different molecular structures. Let us, let us look at a brief description of how to start with basically building these molecules and assigning them proper shapes. The first point or the first step in this entire process of building up of a molecule and eventually giving it the correct or the right shape is to draw the Lewis structures first. Then once these Lewis structures are drawn you are already aware of the total number of lone pairs, bond pairs, etc. And you know how the lone pair, lone pair repulsion, bond pair, bond pair repulsion and the lone pair, bond pair repulsion are going to dictate or determine the molecular shapes. Once this is done, then in the third step, specify the kind of hybridization that you need for the central atom. 